About a month ago, I was hiking in Castle Rock State Park. I was in the lower park, which I'd never been to before. This is, a, this is kind of a thing that I've started doing. I've been trying to do it often, take my dogs out. I have an older dog who doesn't like to go quite as far, so I look for short trails. And the south end of Castle Rock, which I hadn't been in before, but the trail, the trail map said these were short trails. So we went down there and I got onto what I think was the main trail and you're heading towards the back and the map says that if you avoid all these other little trails, you will get to this loop in the back. It's about half a mile, which is about right for my older dog. So we went back there and we're walking down this trail. We're ignoring all the trails that are jarting off to the right. And we're headed straight for this particular loop. And as we're going towards this loop, it's a beautiful little walk. It opens up into this into this prairie space where there's all these prairie grasses and I love prairie grasses so it's this great space and there's trees that line the prairie space and it's great and as you come up over this rise just it's not you know that much but it's just a little bit it's just enough to create an effect that you now get to see a different vantage point of the of the park and off to the left in this open area there's this one stark dead white patinaed weathered tree it's beautiful but I love trees and so I see that, and as we're heading towards the west, we can see this ridge line, and you wind up hiking underneath, kind of underneath the ridge line where there's grasses and trees and, and shade, and it's great. And all of this within half a mile. And so we head back, and I had been keeping track of where we were going. I mean, it's pretty much a straightforward trail. Then we get all the way back around the end of the loop, the dogs and I, and we get to the point where we are supposed to go left, and I went right. So I went right down this loop and we're, we're, but I didn't, I mean, I knew what direction I went, but I didn't realize what had happened as we're going along. I see this tree off to the right and the tree looks kind of familiar, but you know, I like trees and I notice them all the time and trees are trees. I continue walking on and I come to this point where there's this lovely little rise and it's not much, but it's just a little bit of something. And I'm going up this rise and you get this different vantage point of Castle Rock and it's beautiful. And off to the left, I see this beautiful tree that's been weathered and it's white and patina and aged and dead. And now I'm thinking to myself, that tree looks really familiar. And then I look forward to the west and there's the ridge. You can see it through the trees and through the grasses. And I realize to myself, I have successfully made a loop. And so I'm looking at my trail map. I pull it out of my pocket. I look at it and I'm like, yep, I messed up. So then we do the full loop, we get back to the trail, we get back to the parking lot, put the dogs in, and we head home. Now, some of this is a little bit of a bruising of my ego because I do a lot of hiking and I consider myself pretty good at navigating in the woods and reading markers and trails and all those sorts of things. So I was a little frustrated with myself, but more than that, or maybe alongside of that, we humans generally, we don't like to circle around. We don't like to get stuck in loops. We don't like to get paralyzed, sometimes it feels. We don't like to feel like we're not going anywhere. You know, the, the culture tells us we're always supposed to be making two steps forward, one step back. So no matter what we're doing, we're striving towards progress. We're moving forward. We're always making some distance from where we were to where we are supposed to be. We're always moving forward. We don't necessarily like circles. We don't like getting locked up. We don't like pivoting around and coming back to the same thing over and over again. It is dreadful. It can bring about despair, anxiety, frustration in ourselves, frustration in others. And if you feel that way about walking in circles, you may not like the Gospel of Mark. Because Mark likes to move in circles. Mark likes to return to places. Mark likes to return to events. Mark likes to return to themes and concepts of ideas because Mark wants us to know something about Jesus. And Mark tells us at the very beginning of our reading that we have for today, chapter 1, verse 1, right out of the gate, the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Sounds like we should have a trumpet going along with it. Seems like somebody should be out in front of us yelling it at the top of their lungs. This sounds good. The good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Everything else that follows in this book is going to be all about that good news. It's all going to be about Jesus and how great Jesus is. Which is good, because that's why we're here. We want to hear good things about Jesus. So we are moving forward with Mark, and immediately we encounter a guy named John. In your Bible, it might be John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist. Either way, we find out that he's dressed kind of weird and he eats kind of weird. That's a little bit of a throwback to help us think about prior prophets in the Bible. 
whether that's important or not, but that's what Mark does. And then Mark tells us that John is in the wilderness proclaiming God's word, which means it's a transformative word. It's a powerful word. And God is proclaiming God's word to bring the people into the wilderness. These people who have their everyday jobs, people living in their homes, who are selling and, and buying their goods in the, in the market, people who are working their farms. All of these people, Mark tells us, come running out into the wilderness. Which is a little strange because in the Gospels, and often throughout scripture, the wilderness is where there is dread and despair and frustration and isolation. The wilderness was a barren place. There was virtually no water, virtually no food. There are lots of wild animals just waiting to get you because you're no longer at the top of the food chain when you're in the wilderness. It is a place of fear. It's a place of hesitation. It's a place of no light. As soon as the sun sets, there is no light in this space. One could even make the argument this is a hopeless space. Kind of like the days when we wander around where there is no light, when we feel despair, when we feel frustration in ourselves, in our community, in our families, when we feel like we're going nowhere fast, we feel like we are more lost than we are gaining. That's the wilderness. So you and I know the wilderness, and so it's this interesting thing that John is calling people into the wilderness, calling them into the experience of despair and fear and no light. Mark likes to circle back on themes. And Mark takes us to the wilderness because Mark wants us to remember that there is a time that when we are in the wilderness that God is always with us. Now if we had our Bibles handy and we had the time to do it, we would go back to the book of Exodus all the way back at the beginning, second book of the Bible. We'd go back to Exodus and we'd hear about how the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, speaking of no light and no hope. And they cry out to God and God responds by sending them Moses, Miriam, and Aaron. And Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, they knock on Pharaoh's door and Pharaoh opens the door and says, what's up? And they say, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, nope, and shuts the door on them. And then come a bunch of plagues. Some of them are kind of weird like frogs, but I guess they mean something. It's kind of a fun story. Not really. But then eventually God says, this isn't working. So God just sets the people free, God's self. God liberates God's people, sets them free. They run for their lives out into the desert. And then they get to the Red Sea. They cross the Red Sea. They get to Mount Sinai. That's where they meet up with Charlton Heston. He gives them the Ten Commandments. And then they continue on their journey. Now God promises ever since they leave Israel that God will never abandon them. Even though now, based on scripture, they are in the wilderness. Historians and scholars believe that the Israelites, when they were out in the wilderness, going towards the promised land, you know, the land of milk and honey, the place where they will be forever cared for by God, that on their way there, they do several loops in the wilderness. Because as we read scripture, they wind up back at Mount Sinai multiple times. But they're being led by God. So we know that there is some intentionality, or at the very least, we know that there is some comfort in knowing that God is with the people, even though they are wandering in the wilderness. This is part of what Mark wants us to know, that in the midst of our despair, in the midst of our frustration, in the midst of our feeling lost, that God is with us. And we know that because John is calling the people through the wilderness to the River Jordan. Because in the story of Exodus, the River Jordan is what the people cross. The River Jordan is this marker, this boundary line between what was and what will be. So when the Israelites cross over the River Jordan, they become, it's almost like they become a different people. They are now fully God's people and they are fully in the land that God is giving them and God will fulfill God's promises through these people. So John is bringing the Israelites back to the river, back to the water's edge to remind us again of the promise that God continues to give us. John is circling the people back. And while we're out at the river, hanging out with John with his weird clothes and weird dietary habits, John is also telling us that we are there to confess our sins, receive forgiveness, sounds very familiar. But beyond that, there's someone who's coming after John who's gonna baptize us in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. I don't know if you caught it as we were baptizing our brother Logan, but we spoke of the Holy Spirit. We spoke of being bound to God forever. Logan is bound to God forever. Wherever Logan goes for the rest of his days walking this earth, God goes with him. Wherever you go, if you have been baptized 
in the waters of Christ. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you say, wherever you've been, God goes with you. So no matter how far we wander into the wilderness, and we all have our stories of how far we have wandered, we know how far we are in the midst of the wilderness, maybe even today, God goes with us. Even when there is no light, God is with us. The baptism event for us, for Logan, for any one of us, is kind of a circular event. Now, we only need to be baptized once. Logan is good to go. We are all good to go. We don't need to be baptized again. But the gift that God gives us through this water, besides being bound to Christ forever, is that God does it through water. Something that, at least in this part of the world, is in abundance. We can find it almost anywhere. So that truly means that wherever we wander in the world, whenever we wash our hands, splash water on our face, brush our teeth, prepare a meal, anytime we are in contact with water, the Holy Spirit that we are bound to can remind us again that God is with us, that God is walking alongside of us, maybe even God leading us, like the Israelites who circled in the wilderness. We circle back to the baptismal promise. We circle back to those old, old words. Every time we touch water, we are reunited again with our relationship with God and a reminder that we are granted forgiveness and grace and mercy every single time. No matter how far we go, God goes with us. The entirety of the Gospel of Mark, scholars believe, was written as a circle. If you read the entirety of the Gospel of Mark yourself, and we'll do a Bible study on this next month, so we'll get to that later. But if you were to read the entirety of the Gospel of Mark from chapter 1, 1 to the very last verse, which is 16, 8. Of course, it begins, the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Again, seems like it should be heralded. The thing about the Gospel of Mark is no one in the story knows this. Not the disciples, not the sick, not those who are consumed by demons, not the Pharisees, no one. You and I know that because we're reading and Mark wants us to know that. And remember that with every story that we read, every time we circle back to God's promises, we know Jesus is son of God. But no one else knows that. Well, except for the demons and the soldier who watches Jesus die on the cross. That's it. No one else knows who Jesus is, even when they are being encountered by Christ. All these people wandering in the wilderness and don't recognize who Jesus is in their life. And then we get to the very end of the gospel, chapter 16, verse 8. Jesus has already been resurrected. Jesus has come back from the tomb, whatever language you want to use. Except that Mark doesn't have an Easter. Mark has a resurrection, all the gospels do, but it's John, it's Luke, it's Matthew who have the day of days where you get to put on the beautiful hat and the dress and the suit and you get to hear the trumpets and all the beautiful music and have an egg, egg hunt out on the lawn. That's those guys. Mark has none of that. Chapter 16, verse 8, the very last words that Mark declares about the resurrection of Christ, about the good news of Jesus, Son of God, is this. The disciples told no one because they were terrified. That's how the gospel ends. That's how the good news ends. It ends where it begins, in the wilderness. The disciples are terrified. They are without light, they are without hope. They don't know what's going on. They tell no one they are full of despair. And yet, the gospel begins. The good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. So someone told someone along the way, which means the entirety of the gospel is written to circle back. Go all the way back to chapter 1-1 and read it again. And when we get to the very end and we find ourselves in the wilderness again, go back and read it again. And remember, Jesus is Son of God. When we leave these waters, when we leave this space today, we are going to head back into the wilderness. We're going to do our thing. We're going to be led from God. Or maybe we will be pushed away from God, depending on the powers and forces of this world act against us. We are going to experience divisions. We are going to experience despair. We are going to be told that our lives don't matter. We are going to hear others tell our neighbors that their lives don't matter. We are going to find a multitude of ways to push ourselves away from God. 
And yet, when we leave these waters, you and I know who Jesus is. We know the promise. God goes with us wherever we go. God goes with our neighbors wherever they go. God is at work in this world, even when our neighbors don't recognize it, but we know who Jesus is. We know the promise. We know that Jesus is God's son, the revelation of love and life and mercy and justice in this world. So when we leave these waters, we have a word to tell. We have good news to proclaim. We have the very power of God moving through us that we can proclaim how life and light is breaking into this world. We can circle our neighbors back, bring them again to that word. Our coworkers, our classmates, our colleagues, the people who we know dearest who may not recognize Christ in their lives, but we can see grace. We can see God. We know the promises that come from this water, that come from this meal. When we leave this space, we have the opportunity to wander in the wilderness where there is no light, where there may not even be hope, and yet there is always God. You and I get to speak God's name, and we can bring forth light even where there is none. Amen.